What a gathering. My goodness, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you, please. This is one uh, enthusiastic audience. Thank you, please. Very excited. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Boy, great things happen in this county, I'll tell you. Cuyahoga County, thank you. Good to be with you. Wow, this is exciting. What an honor. Thank you so very much for your, your generous welcome. It's, uh, it's great to be here again. I've spent a lot of time in Ohio over the years. Of course, I grew up in Michigan. I apologize. You've got a border security problem <laughs> letting me across the border tonight. I'll tell you, this is a... Uh, but, uh, well, we have a lot in common. We care about a lot of good things. You had some very beautiful young women here that I used to come try and date. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to tell you a, a, a true story, and I, and I probably ought to just apologize for it right now. I don't think I've ever told this story in public. And, uh, and it happened not far. You know where Elyria, Ohio is. Well, there was a young lady there who I had once uh, spent some time with, and, and uh, she, uh, she decided to marry a fellow, and uh, my wife was invited to be, my girlfriend then, was invited to be one of her, uh, one of her bridesmaids. And, uh, and so I came to the wedding, and, and it was a perfect wedding. They had, they had little bottles of shocking pink nail polish so that everybody had, the, all the bridesmaids had the same nail polish. Well, I came, and I thought the wedding was a little too perfect. So I happened to go in the room where the groomsmen and the, and the uh, groom were, and, uh, and I found the groom's uh, shoes, the patent leather shoes that he'd rented, and I took some of that shocking pink nail polish, and I wrote something on the bottom of his shoes. And we went to the wedding, and, uh, and the minister gave a beautiful service, and then he said, let us pray, and the couple knelt down. Now, I hadn't calculated that everybody in the audience would put their head down in prayer so they couldn't see what I'd written on his shoes. But slowly but surely, people ahead of us began to, to shake a little bit and, and point up at the shoes. It, in bright pink letters, it said H-E-L-P on the bottom of his shoes. <laughs> I haven't seen a crowd rock like this in Ohio since then, and I want to thank you for that wonderful welcome. You're most, uh, you're most kind. Um, I'm going to tell you a few family stories tonight. Uh, my, uh, my wife and I were with our, our grandkids, and I, I turned to her and I said, uh, Sweetheart, are we going to do with our grandkids what my parents did with their grandkids? And she knew what I was talking about, because one unusual feature of my mom and dad's uh, uh, investment in their grandkids was that when they get a group of grandkids that reach the age of 10, 11, 12, they'd put them in their, their van, their Ford van, and drive them across the country to go see the national parks. And my mom and dad had 25 grandkids. So, so they did about, I think it was five different trips, and it took about 30 days per trip. So this was quite a commitment on the part of my, my parents. And I knew what they were doing, because I had been, been on this trip myself when I was a boy. Although we didn't have a Ford van back then, it was a Rambler we went around in. And it made the trip, too. It came, anyway, we, we, uh, what my parents were doing was, was teaching my kids to fall in love with America. They, they wanted my kids, their grandkids, to see the canyons and the sequoias and the, the, uh, the, the Purple Mountains majesty and the oceans, and so they took them around from place to place. And between, between national park stops, when I was on my trip, my mom would read to us from a book that uh, told the stories of the settling of America, uh, uh, particularly the American West, and the kind of character of the women and the men that, that had settled America. And, uh, and the name of the book that she was reading from was a book called Men to Match My Mountains by Irving Stone, a book written in the 1960s. He, an historian and biographer. I, by the way, I happened to be telling that story some time ago, and a fellow stood up and said, do you know that the name of that book was taken from a poem? I did not. And then he recited the poem, unprepared. I was impressed. Now I've learned the poem because I think it's relevant. The, the poem goes like this. Bring me men to match my mountains. Bring me men to match my plains. Men with empires in their purpose. And new eras in their brains. The idea was that the people who had come to America, the men and women, 
would have empires in their purpose. Not, not to conquer other nations, of course, but empires of discovery and innovation. That this would be a land of pioneers of all different kinds. And that by virtue of this pioneering, innovative, creative spirit, that we would change the world. We'd bring in new eras in the world. And that's actually been the story of this country. With the first great innovation that comes to my mind, the innovation of the Founding Fathers, which was that the Creator had endowed us with our rights, not the King, not the State, but the Creator. And among them were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that phrase, pursuit of happiness, suggested that in this country, that we would not be limited by the circumstance of our birth, not limited by the direction of government, but instead people would be free to pursue their course in life, to pursue happiness as they, they choose. And because this was the place where people were so free to do those things, we attracted the pioneers and the innovators and made this the land where people with pioneers, with, excuse me, with empires in their purpose and new eras in their brains came and, and, and chose to live. And we shared this innovation with other nations in the world and have helped lift people out of poverty, millions, billions, through that innovation of our founding fathers. Then there have been other innovations, of course, that are not as, as bold and extraordinary as that one. But I, I read a book over the summertime by a, a fellow named Bill Bryson. It's called At Home. And, and in there, he talks about a world exhibition in, in England in 1850, as I recall. Each country was invited to sell or to send uh, exhibits of the, the hardware and the, and the arts of their, of their country. Most countries sent uh, you know, glass blownware and art and, and musical instruments and so forth. America sent some crates. And they opened the crates for America, and inside it was something called a McCormick Reaper. And they put it together, and sure enough, they found that as advertised on the outside of the crates, this device would do the work of 70 people. And by virtue of the innovation of the men and women who created the McCormick Reaper, agriculture changed. We could now feed the world. People could move to cities. The Industrial Age occurred. And with, with pioneers here in Ohio and Michigan and other places, the Industrial Age occurred. And people were able to be lifted even further from poverty, another American innovation. And most recently, the, the new economy, computers, software, the Internet. This is a land which has been shaped by men and women with empires in their purpose and new eras in their brains. I love the dynamics of America, the story of America, the history of this country. I'm glad my kids learned it from my, my parents, their grandparents. And sometimes I'm concerned that our president doesn't understand what it is that makes America so unique. I, I think he, he thinks that government is a source of our vitality and our strength, and every problem is to be solved by government. The answer is free American people pursuing their dreams it what, is what makes America the nation we are and the hope of the earth. Now, now to some degree, his lack of understanding is, is understandable. <laughs> and, and I say that because he's never worked in the private sector. And, and like a lot of people in government, they've never had the, the great fortune of working in, in a regular job, in a regular enterprise, seeing what it's like to try and make a product or, or sell a service. And so they haven't had the experiences that many of you, most of you probably in this room have had. And so they don't understand what it is that makes America work. That, that was brought home to me time and again when I went from the private sector where I spent 25 years and then the Olympics another three years, then went back into, went into government and it's really different. <laughs> By the way, it's harder. What you do is harder. All right? There's no question. What you do is harder than what government does. I say that because if you mess up big time, you lose your job, you lose your investment, you lose the jobs of other people. The, the, the private sector is not forgiving. In government, you mess up, you just raise the debt, you raise people's taxes, you blame the opposition party. It's, it's very discouraging. But what you do is a lot harder. And by the way, every dollar government has to spend only has value if it represents a good or service produced in the private sector. So what you do is not only harder, it's also more essential to the future of our country. I don't think a lot of people in government understand that. 